This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caregiver Chronicles. My name is Sarah, and today I am here with a very special guest who I'm super happy to have. She is from Friends of Autistic People. She's actually the founder of Friends of Autistic People. Her name is Britta Darney von Regensburg. Hey, Britta, how are you? Hi, Sarah. Nice to speak to you. Thank you for having me on today. Thank you (laughs) so much. I'm thrilled to have you here. Would you like to further introduce yourself to my audience? Yeah. Okay, my name is Britta Darani. You did a good job pronouncing my name. Wow, from Regensburg. And I'm originally from Germany. And um, uh, I started Friends of Autistic People in 1997 and uh, as an advocacy and autism education nonprofit organization. And we are based in Greenwich, Connecticut, where in those days, like everywhere else, you didn't have any. Uh, not a lot of services for children and adults with autism. And um, uh, I could tell you why I started it, but that maybe that's the next question. <laughs> that actually is. So that is the next question. Um, telling us how and why I got started. Yeah, um, I got started because um, you know, my accent tells you I'm from, uh, maybe you recognize it, I'm from Munich, from Germany. And in Germany, as you probably know too, social services are very good. And there's a real good social service net, like in Scandinavia, see? Yeah, and then I come here and I'm sort of uh, relaxed and satisfied and and, uh, passive. We are passive citizens over there, not not anymore, I would say. Um, But I I was relaxed and I trusted the system and I felt that everything goes well. Well, I put my daughter in as an adult. Uh, She got into a group home, local group home. She was abused. And I did absolutely not expect that from that organization and the leader, the the head of the organization. It was such a wake up call and such a shock. It made me so, and when I asked about it and their reaction, made me so angry, furious, as a matter of fact, that I said, I need to do something and raise awareness that the children become adults with autism. You can't just then say, oh, you know, it's fine. everything's fine and, and you and not train anybody and not provide any, um, not train any support staff in group homes, not to uh, provide any services and just have them sit there around vegetate and be, and babysit them. Um, so that's how the reason why I founded Friends of Autistic People to raise awareness and to um, work really hard pro bono. I dropped my job. I, I mean, my small business decorating and home accessories from around the world, which I loved. Just gotten a shipment from Morocco of beautiful painted ceramics and mosaic table and all kinds of things. I dropped it, lost, lost total interest. And I had to said, I must do something. And there was a, a young woman uh, from Greenwich, I'm based in Greenwich, Connecticut, was uh, the uh, an anchor woman on channel two, that is CBS TV down here. And um, I called her, I, found, I called up, called her up and said, this is, you know, I need to, I would like autism to be known and I would like to talk about your program about what uh, we, uh, needs to be done for children who grow up and become adults with autism. She said, well, everybody would like their cause to be, uh, would like to talk about their cause on TV, but they can't just do that. 
something good or something bad has to happen for us to put you on. For example, you do a lunch or a dinner or that's the good, you know, she didn't say what bad would have to happen. And I said, okay, so I, I, I did a luncheon. I had uh, the membership list of the parents group of the, that organization where my daughter was abused. I invited everybody for a lunch on my deck and I had, they all came because it was free food <laughs> and very nice weather. And, but they, and, and it, um, I had uh, also contacted the Greenwich radio station. Um, you see, I suddenly turned into an activist from a passive per and, and, I, I, and FAP was founded, Friends of Autistic People was founded. The, the director um, of the of Ben Haven, where Vanessa was, as a matter of fact, in a boarding school for a few years after we finally found out there was a boarding school, a school for autistic children, even way back then, there were about three in Connecticut um, that nobody ever told you about and that's absolutely necessary. So anyway, um, the, the director was had come also made a speech and so it was a very nice uh, opening ce uh, celebration. We had, uh, I still remember the fantastic food, <laughs> salmon, poached salmon we had and wine. <laughs> Everybody was very happy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, it was, and then we, uh, uh, you know, make advertisement for them. They were donating that, what's it called? You know, I'm so bad with names now, I can't. It, 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 I remember in a moment the name. I want them to be known. They were so generous and even delivered that salmon to the house, you see? Yeah, okay. So that's how I started. And yeah. I and we said, you know, it's not enough to, to have a, uh, you know, IDEA, have an education for your children and then leave them hanging and, and falling off the cliff after age 21. So ever since that time, um, I have been raising awareness. I, many people knew me in town from various committees, but also because of the little business I had. Um, and um, when I ran it, and, and we got lots of publicity from the three local papers because the, um, uh, the, the um, editors or the, the journalists were really interested and supportive of this new thing, autism in those days, and even, you know, nowadays too. So. But uh, so we were lucky, we got a lot of publicity and the people that used to be my clients in the supermarket or wherever come, came up to me very often and said, you put autism on the map in this town. We learn about it through you. And so that always made me feel very good. Yeah, so we really <laughs> put autism on the map, even in all of Fairfield County, I would say, you know, even beyond that. There were about three people who all knew each other who were the pioneers the trailblazers for autism. One had a son with Asperger's, which is high functioning, as you know. And she started the first parents group in, and we met once a month in um, Fairfield at the library. And so I met a lot of parents at that, uh, through that. The other one was uh, Lu Lo Lois Rosenwald, who many people know as the founder of ASRC, Autism Research Source, uh, services, yeah, they changed the meaning of their acronym. Um, and then Friends of Autistic and me, who started Friends of Autistic People to advocate for those um, on the entire spectrum. Yeah, so. That's, that's amazing. Um, and I just want to thank you. And also your, your opening ceremony sounds lovely with the salmon and the wine. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> but I really, I really do want to thank you because, you know, your your work is paving the way for my kids and me and activists and advocates to to just help. And that's that's all we want is a good life for kids. I don't like it. Doesn't matter what type of parent you are. And I said type in quotes for those of you who are listening type of parent you are because you know every parent every mother wants her child to succeed or to have the best life they possibly can and for moms of kids on the spectrum especially kids with more profound autism that 
quality of life, that happiness, that success looks very different. Um, so I just then, you know, the neurotypical children, and I'm just like, very grateful for what you're doing. So would you like to talk about the mission of the FAP? Yeah, I had actually touched on it a little bit already to raise awareness and uh, work to improve the lives, the quality of lives of people on the autism spectrum, wherever they are, but especially nowadays, not to forget those on the profound side of the autism spectrum because they, they are not glamorous. They don't have glamorous savant skills or any glamorous skills. It takes for years for them to learn how to button their coat or tie their shoes. Um, they're not going to be in movies so, like The Good Doctor so soon where people say, oh yeah, he has autism. Look, he's so smart. And then, yeah, so uh, we, we are educating the community of to include those with profound autism. To, to see uh, the, that there's a variety and that those with um, profound autism also need to be respected for their skill levels. And that and we need to see that they, with the proper teaching and services, can get can learn skills that then are employable, that eventually they can have a job at what, what, whatever they can do, you know. Yeah. So there's, yeah. for example, Vanessa, there was a rose farm in, in Guilford, Connecticut. Have you heard of that? Roses for Autism? I have the, not, um, but that's really I, interesting. Can you yeah, tell me about that a little bit? Unfortunately, they closed a couple of few oh. years before COVID, unfortunately. They, um, they didn't sell enough because it was a for-profit for business, but they were, tra they were training people with Asperger's and my daughter, because I fought for five, six years to get her into that program, because I know she was good with, uh, she likes flowers, and she once worked at a florist when she was at, um, at Ben Haven, and she was doing so well, because the people who were the, the, the owners knew how to relate to someone with profound autism. And at Roses for Autism, of course, they also knew how to relate for, to people with various forms of autism. So she was going there twice, uh, three times a week. And uh, she was being trained in, they, they would evaluate what she could do and then start at her level. She was being trained in how to remove leaves from the stems of roses so that the roses could be made into bouquets, right? Or put into vases, and you remove the leaves before you put them in the water. She would learn how to um, t take the dead leaves off the blossoms, you see? Yeah, so they look fresh. She would learn, she loved to tie bows. So they, they would make the bouquets, they would tie ribbons around the bouquets. She learned how to make a bow. She would make the bows. Um, she likes to play with water. You know, again, you, you use the skills and interests that somebody has, including those with profound autism. So she was. Um, she learned how to clean the little vases uh, in which the roses, rose stems would go, and would be sent to restaurants in the area. You know, they would change once a week. Yeah. They would change, get their flowers for their tables, and so she would clean the vases and then put them in the rinse them and put them in the dishwasher, and they would get washed once more there. And I even have a little video about that. And so she learned these skills. You know. They, need, they, are, they are useful skills, and so she could actually learn uh, work somewhere at a florist, um, you know, uh, uh, or, to, or a, a farm where, you know, where they have flowers and do various things, you know, like seedlings. You could also plant seedlings in these little pots, these hundreds of little pots, you know, with supervision, of course, and assistance. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. awesome. So, that's that's really wonderful. Um, yeah. I, you I know, talk a I, lot about profound autism. I'm sorry. But yeah. <laughs> no, but that's that's your life and that's your experience as a caregiver and a mom. So and that's that's okay. That's as a matter know, of fact. Yeah. That's everybody's autism. experience is different with autism. Every 
I I have yet to meet another autistic child who is similar to either of my children. Um, even even though there are kids with similar needs and devices, there's there's still a lot of differences with interests and behaviors and emotions and triggers and things that make them feel good and you know it's it's just like neurotypical people there's no two people that are exactly the same there's no yeah. two people with autism who are exactly the same that's right yeah yeah it is actually such a simple thing to realize but of course we want to categorize and say they have autism and that's why they are like this but they're also different you know like uh, as you said like everybody else yeah exactly and that's and that's like you know, there's certain words that I don't like. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's certain words that someone will say to me or phrasing or, like, wording of sentences that it's like, you could have said that nicer, that yeah. that frustrate me. I am sure that there are kids, even nonverbal kids on the spectrum, who feel that way about certain phrases, especially because they pick up on your emotions. And Absolutely. they do understand your tones. And, you know, so I yeah. just yeah. – and this is just things I see with my kid and other kids. So. Yeah, Fact, Vanessa, is, I noticed when I finally realized, hey, this, what we say, she's offended. That's why she's sounding, you know, she screams at certain times. Yeah. We have to, she wants, when I meet somebody in the street and say hi, I need to introduce her too. She wants yep. to be also. Yep. And then we should talk when in the conversation. Now, I always tell, tell people, we need, you know, let's include Vanessa. We, um, or I just act that way. I don't have to always say it. You know, I make sure that I say, you know, Vanessa, don't you think, or whatever, I make sure that the in, the person I speak to notices it, you know, that yeah. we need to No, that's yeah. wonderful. Otherwise, we, we're treating them like a, you know, we treat a child like a piece of rock, you know, yeah. or a piece of, yeah. And they're not, they're human too. They cannot speak, you know, we have to yeah. be aware, yeah. So yeah. I have to make... And Vanessa does use an AAC device. I saw that online. Yeah. She an iPad too. Um, I, yes, which, not she doesn't like to use it. <laughs> I she think she, like wants to talk. <laughs> she wants me to talk to her because we talk about everything. You know, I don't just say, you know, where we go to eat, what we go shop, what we need to buy. Well, I talk about that's why, and this is so important for parents to know, their children learn a dormant vocabulary even if they cannot speak, they learn a lot of vocabulary. If you just keep talking, you have to talk about everything to them so that they understand it. Yeah. Yes. Yep. We do that with my son. I'm, this is yeah. this, we're going here, we're going to do this. And I also tell him he's the greatest kid in the world, but <laughs> <laughs> every That's parent does that. <laughs> very smart and very beautiful. <laughs> um. So what are some of the services that FAP offers? Okay, um, now uh, we started as a non, uh, as an advocacy and autism education to educate the parents and the public and the legislators. Uh, we added uh, music therapy a few years ago for, uh, for children and adults with profound autism because the parents can, you know, the parents can really not afford it. And we can only afford a certain number also of children, but we do what we can to support some kids with autism and, and pay their, their music therapy partially or in full. It depends on, it's, it's a graduated pay, um, level of uh, call it contribution. Yeah. So we, we graduate how much we pay, but mostly we pay uh, uh, the biggest part of the therapy. Yeah. So it's uh, $4,000 a year. If anybody feels that and wants to contribute, um, we would like to add a few more kids. To, we have 10 so far. We'd like to add a few more kids to support them too. And we, we are actually planning to uh, start a horticultural therapy service with a family that, that's very interesting, that uh, bought uh, quite a few years ago, bought a house with a big yard that they converted into a small farm. What gave them that idea? Friends of autistic people for many years um, uh, advocated and they still are uh, raising funds to create a farm for adults with uh, autism, children and adults. 
but mostly adults because we want to have a home there too, your home. So the, it's for uh, adults, you know, for adults with autism, with profound autism to live there. Um, so when uh, we had um, a parents group meeting every other week and talk about this farm project and um, then eventually wrote a white paper, which is on our website about the farm, what it would be, why and what it would look like. And then we started fundraising. And of course, at that time, the, the, the big parent group slowly, actually quite quickly disappeared into the woodwork when it came to fundraising. So we're still at the fundraising stage. We have a separate account for that. But uh, one of the, at one of these meetings and uh, seminars, um, that we did uh, was a, a couple and they were so inspired by what uh, by this project that they decided to buy this house with a big yard and create their own little farm for their home because uh, so their son when he grew up could live in that house and have something to do some farming and they were hoping you know to have uh, more kids and we actually we that's where we start a horticultural program in, this spring so that kids can help learn how to farm or garden or horticultural therapy, whatever you might want to call it. Yeah. You know, our kids also learn very slowly and simply simple things first, step by step. So that's uh, what we are planning to do to add because this farm project will need a million dollars yeah. to buy land in the Trombo area, in the Monroe area, you know, we can't go all the way to the northern part, uh, end of Connecticut because the parents that we, who, who we are relating to, who relate to us, they are in Bedford County most, of, or New Haven, you know, county. So you cannot expect them at age 70 to travel all the way to the end of Connecticut to see their children. You could, but, you know, if you have a yeah. choice, so anyway, the land is not, we, we're looking, we have been looking for land, not in Greenwich, of course, it's, it would be ridiculously expensive, but in the Monroe, Trombo area, there's a lot of farmland, actually, in Newtown, there's a lot of farmland. We found a farm, they were, it was a million dollars, but they wanted a down payment, it was in fantastic condition. I mean, the home, even the home in which these people live, had five bedrooms, or uh, four, actually, four bedrooms, and three bathrooms already and an indoor pool which you know would be ideal for our kids as a, a swim therapy yeah and kids with autism love the water and to swim and you would need to make you know make sure you teach someone to yeah, as long them. as it's locked up and there's like an alarm on the door for the pool you know yes. obviously just so nothing happens but Right, right. But if they swim, and you, that's why it's so important for every parent to teach their child who has autism to swim, because very often they escape, they run away and, you know, find a, find a river, find a pool. You hear it again every year that somebody drowned. Yes, drowning is actually one of the number one causes of early death with autism, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. that's why it's, it's so important for parents to make sure even babies can learn to swim. My daughter learned to swim at, well, not as a baby, but like around four or five years of age when she, we moved to Greenwich because we found a nursery school here, four years of age, yeah. Yeah. She learned swimming and she loves it. She's very good at that. So yeah, that's important for parents to know. Make sure you, teach, you get to the Y or YMCA or wherever, teach your child to swim, yeah. Then if he escapes to a pool somewhere, you know, he won't die. Yeah, exactly. Well, I have a GPS tracker on my kiddo. Um, I highly recommend, you know, yeah. the Angel Scent GPS tracker for families. Ours just went through the washer and dryer, and we put it in rice, and it still managed to work um, after 14 hours in rice and going through the washer and dryer. Um, and their customer service is fantastic. So I highly recommend that for families. Also, I am going to link your website. So um, I know that there's spots to donate through your website. So if any family wants to donate to Friends of Autistic People to help with music therapy or to help get this farm project going, because, you know, agricultural therapy, gardening and animal therapy, this is all, like, 
and even like you said the place with the pool like water therapy this is all like amazing therapies that aren't always easily accessible for families and the insurance doesn't pay any of those yeah exactly and for you know some families with kiddos on the spectrum they can only afford what the insurance will cover and that's i'm one of those families it's very frustrating having the access to it in one place and having the data for it i could see this being just life-changing for adults who are on the Uh, spectrum even uh, children as a place to go Yes, yes, exactly. With school, you know, that's the idea. It will be a, an outdoor classroom. You yeah. have an outdoor, you can come several times a week. You can learn so much. You, that's, you know, of course, the idea is to have horses, a horse. Many people like to board their horses, so there would be an income automatically. Then have a, a goat, you know, goats are so much fun. Or ch- and chickens to feed and to pet. pet. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, therapy. we have a young man who is already over 20, you know, out of school. He's an artist, as a matter of fact. His parents were so appreciative of what we were doing that they wanted to help. So since he's an artist and loves to work, would love to live and work on a farm, he drew six scenes, six farm scenes. So like Grandma Moses in that style, you know, and very simple. Very cute, that little figures, little animal. So he, he designed six scenes and we had them made into six postcards. And we sell the postcards as a pack of six, set of six. And um, that's how we they tried to help us raise money. But we had a benefit event with Tom, Tommy Hilfiger and his wife, Dee. Both of them have um, teenagers, I think close to age 21 soon with uh, Asperger's, right? So anyway, he, we did um, a fashion show with three, or, three autistic kids of various, uh, in, on various parts of the spectrum. My daughter and somebody like the artist who is medium, you know, unfortunately we don't have any better terms yet, medium functioning, medium to high, and then one who is totally, in, lives independently, but he's on the autism spectrum too. Yeah, very handsome yeah. boy and so we had a fashion show including high school kids and uh, the three kids with autism and it was off awesome how they collaborated and how they even my daughter with her profound non-verbal autism felt so accepted you know it was amazing yeah so yeah it was nice and they modeled uh he'll figure close tommy he'll figure close <laughs> and miss connecticut was there too and modeled <laughs> <laughs> wow that's <I> know. <laughs> that's like super impressive okay um yeah. well, I, was I, lucky I feel like a so- nobody now talking to you <laughs> <laughs> no, no i'm good at you know i live in a town where you have access if you work really hard and you're smart and you you know sometimes you have access took me uh, to get hill figure took me 10 years to, yeah to, you know because before he was divorced he wouldn't say that his child has Asperger's. It was a stigma then. I don't know if you remember those times when it was a stigma. People, parents did not want to uh, you to say that child has autism. No, 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 he could not say that. And the Board of Ed would not tell you how many kids were on the spectrum when you call. Now it's out in the open, no more stigma. You know, exactly. now we, it helps us get the services that we need for our kids in school. Yeah, and afterward. Yeah. Exactly. Erasing the stigma is what is what helps. It's what helps bring it out in the open. It's what makes me be able to bring my kids to Target. I know that's not as fancy as a fashion show, but... <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. It's, you know, he can go into Target and just be, just be himself in Target. And, you know, if he's making sounds or just yelling or just being happy nobody is going to say anything or you know occasionally we'll get an eye roll or a you know and yeah. it, it does it does happen I'm, I'm not going to say it doesn't but and, and I've even had people stop and tell me how to discipline him when he was melting down in Target and I've, been, <laughs> I've been like oh so you're an autism expert like <laughs> I was unaware um yeah. but like but like you said you know getting getting rid of the stigma is such a key to inclusivity and you know just making the world inclusive so that's 
That's awesome. That whole it's one of the missions that you said. You know, mission is to make the world for our kids inclusive, no matter whether they're on the spectrum. And now we have, um, you know, I've been advocating and testifying in in Hartford and at the legislative office building when we had the ARC organized a an I slash DD. Um, circle of meetings and we would meet once a month and uh, everybody would come and uh, talk about how the budget cuts. We had a governor, Malloy, do you remember Governor Malloy? Yes. He slashed the budget every year and uh, all together in three years by nine, uh, close to $90 million, the budget for the Department of Developmental Services. So you see people who need a wheelchair sometimes couldn't get the wheelchair anymore. People with speech services need speech services couldn't get, you know, they're not mandated anyway. But um, uh, when, whereas you got get sometimes speech services when the budget was not cut, uh, afterward you could not get it anymore. The, the group home where my daughter is, they had two vans so that people who had doctor's appointments more or less at the same time could go to their doctor's appointments now or to leisure activities or whatever shopping if necessary for clothes um, nowadays you only have one van and you have to be so it makes it you know they all have to go as a group rather than independently so again it's more like oh yeah there's the group with the, the disabled people again you know yeah rather than living a life uh, like anybody else in the in the community now you again present this image of a group, you see? I mean, they try to get take them out independent, individually, but it's very difficult. Difficult, yeah. So advocating for with the legislation is one of the big things uh, Friends of Autistic People is, for, is, is doing. And as a matter of fact, uh, during the COVID crisis in 2020, I, I, I took the opportunity to participate in a training course called Partners in Policy Making, and I got my Diploma. It was uh, twice a once, no, twice a month on online via Zoom versus having to travel to Wethersfield every time, stay overnight. So that uh, yeah, so um, because I learned, I expand my knowledge about the history and about how to advocate and about civil rights. Our kids have civil rights, you know, and in the, when they're adults, they're very often so. Uh, especially in group homes, yeah. they are really violated a lot. They are told what to do. They're not give if they want tea, they, they can't have it. At the, you know, when they want herbal tea, they were, my daughter likes herbal tea. And uh, she was the new group home manager said she can have it at eight o'clock in the morning. I said, and, and, and how about at noon or no, eight o'clock, that's it. I mean, this is not normal. That's, that's a violation of her civil rights to have whenever she feels like, you know, like you and I, even if you somebody lives in a group home. Uh, so there has to be, uh, so we advocating for transparency in the group home, for the uh, observe, observe, what we say, observance, observation, observance of their civil rights, non-violation of their civil rights, to have a PTA-like group uh, where parents and caregivers, you know, the underpaid caregivers that we usually have under management get together regularly and discuss issues, issues, you know, quote unquote, really problems, and find solutions rather than the management hiding things and, and you know, not we really have to dig, uh, find out what happened um, and, and try to get uh, things improved. So we, that's one of the big, big missions we have to, to fight for the rights for adults with autism. Also on the you know high functioning end, but but we see that our kids who have profound nonverbal autism, very often nonverbal, really tend to fall through the cracks. And yeah. somebody uh, who does an uh, organization called ARC of Connecticut, uh, um, you know, the acronym. What it means, it has changed meaning. But anyway, that's the uh, entity in Connecticut that advocates strongly with the government to for the rights of people with disabilities. And the um, 
ex executive administrative assistant told me, you're, you're the only one who still talks about those with profound autism. I was shocked and at the same time pleased that I was that I was known to her that I'm fighting for the rights of everyone on the spectrum. Yeah, there's a lot of, so what I recommend to parents whose children are still small, you know, don't, you know, the child it, it, uh, grows up very fast, you know, school time goes fast. And while you're struggling so hard to get the services in the IP, IEP meetings, that seem to get harder and harder to get because of a lack of money nowadays, right? Because there are more and more kids and competing for the funds that the school has available. At least in Greenwich, this is how it was this past year. It was a real fight going on between parents and Board of Special Education, which you don't expect in Greenwich, but boy, did it go on. Yes, the, board of, the head of the Board of Special Ed even got fired over that, yeah. which was a you know, in it, that, and that would be a good thing. So yeah, don't uh, you know, relax and say, oh, so far away. Make sure whenever somebody says, we need your signature, or maybe you can come with us to Hartford and test, you know, and advocate or listen in. Don't just expect everybody else will do it for you. Uh, when I started um, to talk about these things, that's what parents did because they didn't realize that later on there was really nothing for adults with autism. Um, and they said, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I have to work, I have this, I have to. Very rarely anybody came along too hard for this me. Um, now, many more parents are afraid. There's a parents group now that whose kids are almost adult or over adult. And now they realize, and you know, again, we need to do something about it. But again, mostly a few people do the work and it should be all the parents because the more people we have screaming at the legislators, you know, the more signatures, the more people come to meetings. It's called the critical mass. That critical mass is so important for our legislators to actually pay attention to, to, to create the services that we need. And there have been more bills drafted now for autism also but um, a lot more has to be done, a lot more. And so that's one of the missions that I'm working on, a, a, um, to, a, a bill that would create better services for good, really good services for those who live with profound autism. Yeah. With profound autism, because they're falling, as I said, they're falling through the cracks. Yeah, a lot of times it, that, care falls on the parent and the caregiver and a lot of times you know the parent has been battling the school district and doctors and insurance companies yeah. and therapists and has felt isolated and all these other things their whole child's life that they just get to the point where there's just no fight left yeah and um tired and, and frustrated you, you know you just yeah, you just get to the point where it's like, there's no use. I've already tried fixing the system and I can't fix it. And and yeah. for the ones who keep going, the ones like you who keep going and just, like I said before, you are making the world a better place, not just for your daughter, but for my kids. Yeah, I yeah. hope that the work that you're doing continues and grows. And I hope that I can follow in your footsteps in a way as as an advocate as somebody who is loud and proud and big and strong and just helps yeah. just just helps make the future for what would be my grandchildren's i don't see me having grandchildren but you never know um what would be my grandchildren or my nieces and nephews children a better place for them in the following generations because i know autism doesn't just begin and end in my house i know it's all over the world it's something that every like you know it's just something that like every family has is going to be affected by in one way or another it's yeah. something that is never ending it's it's as long as humanity is going to exist we're going to have neurodivergence oh, in the world you know, did you hear i'm sure you know it's one in 44 kids has autism now yes um uh, uh yeah cdc number yeah yeah and i and i believe that that statistic is true i honestly believe that that statistic is true for adults yeah. i think that there was just no diagnosing that yes. you know i hear my 
not so much my parents, they're more accepting, but, you know, people from my parents' generation say things like, oh, autism didn't exist when we were kids. Is it not that it didn't exist or is it that it was hidden and also, you know, some idiosyncrasies adults have that, that are just weird or odd? You're actually autistic. You're just different. You're just higher functioning. It was, But it was mostly you were hidden away if you were profound. And if you were like my older son where, you know, you could function, you were just weird. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, uh-huh. and you were known in a small town or village in a village. Everybody knew about you. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they were tolerant. In villages, usually people are tolerant, but you know, there's yeah. things to do with them very often. You know, in the field, in the house, in the, with the animals. That's why a farm is such a good idea. We also advocated. Um, I was invited to the NGO section of the United Nations wants to do a pre- presentation with others who are who were also presenting about their various causes. Uh, so that was a highlight in 2016. Yeah, so that was nice. That's yeah. incredible. <laughs> yeah, because the, the United <laughs> Nations now includes autism and disabilities in their sustainability goals. Yeah. And that's wonderful. I mean, yeah, sadly it's needed, but it's wonderful. It, yeah. And it's like I said, it's it's an infinite thing that's going to exist. Like, like I don't want to call autism a problem because yeah, no, not it's necessarily a, a problem. It's just a different brain. Challenge, yeah. So maybe it's a yeah, it's an understanding. It can be a challenge for some families, dep- you know, depending on where and in some people. But it's it's mostly it's just a different brain and a different way of thinking yeah. and a different way of learning and a different way of living. And, right. you know, it, but it's infinite and there's always going to be people who need it. So you've, you've just done amazing advocacy. Um, and I know we've already talked about how autism related services improved since you've become an advocate. So I'm going to ask you a slightly different question. What is the highlight of your advocacy experience? Oh, <laughs> Maybe I'm selfish, but I really enjoyed getting the award, <laughs> the Spirit of Greenwich Award, because uh, so many high society ladies get it, you know, and I'm as a, an immigrant, and as an immigrant, you're always a little bit on a different s- section, so semi-accepted, so, you know, um, anyway, I see who, um, how people, w- uh, okay, so yeah, I got that award with together with, uh, let's say, six or seven others from very high society. <laughs> Spirit of Greenwich Award, you had to have three people writing uh, fantastic reports about what you're doing. Oh, yeah, one of the ladies, I apparently had um, managed to become friendly with one of the ladies who was very, very wealthy in Greenwich, and she was on the board of the YWCA, and then among all those people who submitted the three uh, three um, backers reports you know um, she apparently supported she she favored or she supported uh, giving the award to me together with whoever with the other seven ladies who got it that year every year they select people who or who are volunteers in in town you know and doing extreme extremely good work. So yeah, so that was really a highlight. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's when that's we had saying... our, our best, our first benefit event. I had Senator, uh, who, uh, at that time, Attorney General Richard Blumenthal, as our special guest, <laughs> and he said, I sent him a letter, and then I'm, I went to a meeting, and I sat in the front row, and I stared at him, and he was so scared not to accept my invitation. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I would hit him over the head if I didn't say yes. <laughs> so that, in a way, was a nice introduction to, to my getting legislators to come to our events. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's awesome. That's just that's just amazing. You've, like I said, you've really you've really done so much advocacy work and so much amazing advocacy work. So yes. my next question is. What would you say to other parents of autistic children who might be struggling, whether they're children or adult children? Right. Uh, Don't give up. Don't give up. You know, Um, as as they say, treat yourself well, maybe once a week, 
do something for yourself if you if possible you know if at all possible somehow um i find it also it's important that you stay connected to friends that you don't lose all your friends and um because you need to meet people sometimes who do not talk about autism you try not to talk about autism all the time you know foster your other interests and um uh, if if possible you know sometimes you just can't but do something for yourself and and don't give up and don't forget that life continues after school and uh, advocate if somebody helps uh, ask you for a signature the, uh, as much as you can yeah and then um we'll make friends with your letters your your, your um, selectman uh, your mayor uh whatever it, he's or she's called in your town make friends with the legislators you will need them when you when you realize you have reached the end of your road and you really need something for your child you need that friend make sure you have friends in the high in high places that uh, are able to help you and uh, to whom you can tell your personal stories because they when they hear the personal stories that's really what makes them act you know yeah. that they, they say i'm my child is your your constituent and he has uh, rights and uh, we cannot let this and that happen and or he falls through the crack her falls through the crack um i need your help and um make sure that you also um, maybe make friends with the local press or the radio station so that when time comes you can say you can invite a reporter you can say you know let's take a picture i'll send it to the, the local times yeah publicity is very important to legislators yeah you know yeah. Not about and it's it's an important part of advocacy too though yeah. you know because yeah. how can you spread the word without you know i mean you can do it one person at a time but when you can mat reach a mass amount of people that's you know that's like Part of caregiver chronicles the more people we can reach and help the more the more the word gets out there and the more inclusion there is so i really i really like that and read up about what you're entitled to about the law of, about special idea you know what is your right make sure you read up on that and even though you don't have much time at all my daughter didn't even allow me to read when she was little she would scream i had so to read when she was in bed um but you have to be informed the better informed you are the more e the easier it will be later when you need that you can point to that law you say but this is the law this is what it says so what are you going to do about this you know, yes yeah join, join groups join parents groups yeah all of that stay yeah, uh, so yeah. activism you know which i didn't grow up with this really important yeah well it was done for you in germany it sounds like it sounds like everything was just like you need this yeah. here you go which is like amazing yeah. i wish it were that way here i really do but it's not so because it's not we have to we have to keep fighting for it um right. so yeah. the next question is or actually, my second to last question, is there anything else you'd like to share with my audience? Well, um, <laughs> that uh, really, it's really the most important thing is to be active, to be aware, to educate yourself. And I myself have to, that's, uh, you know, one of my big goals to, to read up on all the laws that exist. Uh, I've done research a summer ago with an intern and, and then read up and, and make sure I make notes and um, concerning what my your child needs so that you um, you equipped with knowledge of what exactly how to how to tackle uh, the needs of your child and when you see okay there's this bill that bill that bill you know it's time consuming to read all of that in the opinion neck because it's not it's boring also um but then if you see a gap of what is not uh, legislated uh, that your child needs then you can say to your mayor or to, to your representative um whom hopefully you will contact you know and will make friends with that this is really what is needed you know um we have a gap here 
and uh, my child needs uh, such and such therapy or or and 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 cannot speak or uh, whatever he he or she needs this how can we do that together as a matter of fact i we have a new representative in town in greenwich and um she was somebody made her me aware of her because she was so opposed to adding more funds to the special ed budget so i called her and we talked we became sort of friends she is even willing to help me with uh, getting a law on the books it's just i need to read up some more what exactly you know now and now it's uh it's important for me to know what really is uh, what i really want you know now yeah. that my uh, i broadened my vision and i yeah um so you always have to keep on in in it uh, it's hard when your children all live at home and, and so much it's overwhelming but don't lose track of that overall goal whenever you can read up on the law make notes in a special book so that you can fight for what your child will need because by the time he's an adult i'm sure we don't have everything yet you know before before your six-year-old well it's our hope that by that time he would have what he needs but if not you're equipped you know yeah that uh, to <laughs> to to be able to to formalize to, to vo uh, verbalize what what is needed yeah just uh, yeah no, I, I really love that advice. Um, I, I think that it's so important to be involved and connected in the community, especially when you have children on the spectrum, it can be so isolating. So the more, con the more connections you have, the better off you'll be. So my yeah. last Can question. Let me give you one more simple advice. You know, just maybe yes, simpler. go for it. Like my daughter loves manicure, pedicure. Go have her to get it done every other week or maybe as much as you can once a month you know it's expensive actually um and then go to the same place always so then she has a friend there go uh, whatever she has done maybe who has needs a haircut make friends with a barber or the hairdresser expand go to if you go to church or temple make friends you know always go at the same time same place May, try to make friends so that your circle enlarges that you have a group of uh, a friendship circle in the community for that for your child yeah no i really i really love that advice too um so where i'm just wondering where can my audience find more information for friends of autistic people can you share the website yeah it's www.autisticadults.org you know, autistic adults, plural, dot yes, O-R-G, yes. org. It means we are a non-profit organization. We, by the way, have been working pro bono since 1997. Everything, you know, so, and I have a home office, so we don't have to pay rent. And so, um, you know, everything you donate goes really practically directly where it has to go. We, awesome. of course, buy cartridges sometimes, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. Basically in the office. But um, yeah, it, it's really does very little red tape. That's one of the things people always worry about red tape. There's so little red tape here. We have yeah. interns in the summer, if possible, they become less and less willing to come regularly. I think because remote learning uh, work has become so popular. But I find that I, if I somebody have if I have someone in the office, we do a lot more work faster together. Then yeah. yeah, so that's it. Autisticadults.org. Even though we are friends of autistic people, we we like to focus uh, on what happens to our children as they transition and become adults. And uh, so, autisticadults.org is the website. Awesome! Thank you so much. I am just so grateful to speak to you um thank you oh, so I'm much so for your time you. no really thank you for having me and uh, yeah i'm uh, so uh, uh techie so that this is fantastic for me <laughs> to be able to put this on and i even know you know i i'm good at facebook thank god <laughs> yeah. and because i don't do tiktok yet and instagram is very um, i'm very new at that well, I'm yes. on all of those, so I'll be sharing this on all on all of my social media platforms as I as I always do. 
Um, and, you know, I'll give you the information to share on your social media and, you know, with whoever you'd like. Um, and if somebody has an urgent need, by the way, um, they can call me or, you know, a, a really good source of information help is the Artisan Society of America. They're now called Artisan Society, AS, and they have a, a number 1-800-3-AUTISM. And they have a, that's a direct line where, where you can find, where you can get information and uh, referrals and yeah. yeah. So, Field no, work. that's awesome to know. Thank you so much. And I will make sure that I link those in the show notes for our audience so you can go back and you can link, you can donate, and you can help Friends of Autistic People. Um, and, you know, if you need resources, you can reach out to Autism Society. So thank you so much. And um, reach out to FAP to FAP, Friends of Autistic yes. People. Yep. <laughs> and this will wrap up this week's episode. Um, Britta, again, thank you so much for your time. To all of our listeners, if you have any questions or comments about this episode, you can reach us at caregiverchroniclespod at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook, Caregiver Chronicles. You can find me on Instagram, Caregiver Chronicles 2. Twitter, we're Caregiver Chronicles 1. And we'll see you next week where we speak to Elizabeth Yoder from Planning Across the Spectrum. Thank you so much for listening.